ನಮೋತ್ಥಸ ಭಗವತ ಅರ್ಹತ ಸಂಬುದ್ಧ ನಮೋತ್ಥಸ ಭಗವತ ಅರ್ಹತ ಸಂಬುದ್ಧ ನಮೋತ್ಥಸ ಭಗವತ ಅರ್ಹತ ಸಂಬುದ್ಧ Okay, we are continuing now with the explanation of Sutta number 27 in the Majji Manikaya. This is the Chula Hati Padopama Sutta, the shorter discourse on the simile of the elephant's footprint. And in last week's session, I finished the explanation of the four elephants. jhanas and now i have to backtrack a little and explain that for the attainment of any of the early stages of liberation in the buddha's teaching this is in my understanding the attainment of the jhanas is not absolutely essential in this sutta the buddha is explaining in concise form the path to the highest goal to the attainment of final liberation our hardship in the particular mode in which he himself has attained it that is the path that leads through the four jhanas to the what's called the three vijas the three true knowledges three higher knowledges because he's developing explicating the simile of the elephant's footprint how does one track the elephant by following the path that the elephant has taken and metaphorically here the buddha is the elephant the naga mahat mahanaga the elephant in indian mythology or in indian indian belief as a symbol of might power and majesty and so in tracking the elephant one follows the steps that he has taken and now these are the steps that the buddha has taken and so one is following him step by step and so as i said in an earlier talk what given in the sutta is a very bare sketch of one particular mode of the path to liberation it's a concise presentation of the path which takes it's a very complete presentation in that it takes all four jhanas and these three higher knowledges earlier though i used this example analogy of if you're looking at a map of the United States a road map of the United States and you look at New Jersey you'll just see the main thoroughfares route 80 287 what what are some of the others New Jersey turnpike but you won't see all of the little roads you won't see certainly won't see 623 517 the roads that we usually travel on route 15 you won't see so there are many complex byways and roadways that one could take to final liberation and on the board here i've shown this rather i've used the written this rather complicated diagram just to show various pathways that might be taken i'm not going to explain it at length that will take that would take a whole session in itself but we have these four stages of liberation i will explain them a few suttas from now we come to a sutta which mentions them then i will explain them at great only for now i just mention that there are these four stages okay now the first stage stream entry in this is in my view the way i understand the suttas can be reached 
by a path of direct insight, even without developing a high degree of prior deep concentration. It can be reached by developing access concentration, then developing insight on the basis of that access. It can be reached by developing the first jhana, then developing insight based on the first jhana. But one could go to the first Second jhana, then to insight. First, second, third jhana, then to insight. Or one could develop all four jhanas, then to insight. To reach the first stage. The second stage, one could approach in the same way. So it's characteristic here is that one could reach these first two stages either through direct insight or even just through access concentration without developing jhanas. Now it seems, this is the impression I get from the suttas, certain suttas, that to reach the third stage, this is the stage of non-returning, that's one who, when passing away, doesn't come back to the human realm or even to the sensuous, sensual realm, heavenly world but they're reborn, they're not yet finally liberated, but they're reborn in certain very, very exalted celestial realms, divine realms, as non-returners. Now, in order to reach those, that third stage, it seems that one would have to develop at least the first jhana, and then build insight on the basis of that first jhana. Because the non-returner cuts off the attachment to the sensuous realm of existence. And it is, it's in the first jhana that one attenuates temporarily sensual desire. But then one can reach non-returning through by developing either two jhanas, three jhanas, four jhanas. And similarly, to reach arahatship, one would need, I believe, at least the first jhana, but one could go for two jhanas, three jhanas, four jhanas. This is the way I read the suttas. But the Pali commentaries, and I believe even the Sanskrit Northern Tradition commentaries, say that there is a type of even Arahant who doesn't develop jhanas. They call them, in Pali it's called Sukha Vipastaka, which means dry insight Arahant. I think in Chinese you have dry wisdom, is that the expression? Gan Hui, Gan Hui. Gan Gan Hui Di. Li? Di. Follower. I see, I see, I see, I see, I see. Stage. Gan Hui Di. I'll say there. Insight or wisdom, it's called dry because jhana is thought of as a kind of moisture, like a water that moistens or softens the mind. So when the wisdom lacks that softening effect of jhana, then it's very hard and dry, but still it can be effective in eradicating the defilement. Okay, but we're going to continue with the approach taken by here with, by the disciple who's going to, who's now attained and mastered the four jhanas and is now going to <clears throat> pursue the path 
through the three higher knowledges, what are called in Pali, the three vijas. In Chinese, it's Ning. Ning. Right tone? Yeah, San Ming. Okay, to our Western way of thinking, some of these knowledges, okay, might seem incredible, unbelievable, <clears throat> but we have to <clears throat> realize that the mind that has passed through the four jhanas and realize the four jhanas becomes an extremely powerful instrument. And on the basis of the fourth jhanic mind, the mind of the fourth jhana, texts say it's possible to develop five types of higher worldly knowledge, or worldly abilities. One, are called, one is called the different types of psychic powers, the ability to multiply the body, make it become many, the ability to fly through the sky, the ability to walk on water, to sink in the earth, various types of psychic powers. The only one that I've personally experienced myself is that of flying through the sky. <laughs> But for that, I've had to <laughs> get an airplane ticket. <laughs> Excuse me? <laughs> the second one is the divine ear, the ability to hear sounds far away in other world systems, the ability to read the minds of others. And some suttas mention those three higher powers, but they're not mentioned here. I think the reason, there's, I think a reason why only these three are mentioned together as a group very often. Would anybody have an idea what the reason might be why these three are grouped together? The three, yeah. Yeah. I think that's a good way to explain it. But if anybody could put the main point more succinctly, particularly in relation to the third knowledge, I think that gets takes it, it, it already. That takes it at a too philosoph. That's a good point, but at too philosophical a level, I take it at a more sort of gut level. Yeah. Not quite what I had in mind. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, let me maybe put put the question in a way that might be, make my point clear. What in what way would the recollection of past lives, the ability to see beings passing away and being reborn, why should those knowledges tie up with the knowledge of the four noble truths? Exactly. That's exactly what I wanted. It's those first two knowledges which really bring out the nature of dukkha, of suffering. Okay. Now the meditator has gone through these four jhanas. Now this is, these four jhanas now form the preparation for the first of these true knowledges, the recollection of past lives. And each of these jhanas gives a certain very high degree of power and clarity to the mind. Power, precision, and clarity. So we could say even in access concentration, the mind is like, we might call it like a refractory telescope 
It's like an ordinary telescope that one uses to look at the stars, the kind of telescope that you buy in a telescope in a in a shop you buy for kids or somebody has astronomy as a hobby, they buy an ordinary telescope. But the first jhana is like a reflecting telescope, like Newtonian telescope. More still more powerful. Second jhana, the mind becomes like maybe the telescopes that were developed, the observatories beginning early decades of the 20th century. Second jhana. Third jhana, the mind becomes like the telescopes in the Mount Wilson Observatory. Palomar, Mount Palomar Observatory. And the mind of the fourth jhana is like the Hubble Space Telescope. (laughs) Very, very powerful mind which has been brought to the state of stillness, complete stillness and equanimity in which the mind is purified through this mindfulness. And so coming to the text, this is in page 276, paragraph 23. When his concentrated mind is thus purified, bright, unblemished, rid of imperfection. This is upakilesa. Imperfection is not such a good word. These are just like the minor blemishes or corruptions. But you have minor corruptions, little defilements, Then these are important words, malleable, wieldy, steady. The mind is very malleable. It could be molded and shaped according to one's needs. And it is wieldy. It could be used as an instrument for various purposes. It is steady. And it's imperturbable. It's very smooth. Unagitated. Completely still. And silent. Then he directs it to knowledge of the recollection of past lives. And according to the the Sudhimagga, there's a particular method, a systematic method in which this is done. The Sudhimagga is a very comprehensive, commentarial type text developed for by and for meditators. What the meditator does first, one enters into the first, into the fourth jhana and brings the mind to the state of imperturbability then to develop the recollection of past lives one can't do it in the jhana itself but one has to bring the mind out of the jhana back to the so called ordinary consciousness but it's still the mind is still suffused with that power and clarity of the jhana And then one starts recollecting the events that took place immediately before that sitting. One recollects coming to one's seat, maybe crossing the leg, getting the mat ready, crossing the legs, closing the eyes, entering the jhana. Okay, then one starts recollecting the events before that. 
until one starts recollecting all the events that took place in the course of this day, the same day. Then one goes back and recollects what happened yesterday, recollecting the main event. If the memory gets a little cloudy, one just enters momentarily into the jhana and comes out and then goes back and recollects. Then one starts recollecting in larger and larger units. One doesn't, of course, have to recollect every event in one's life, but one can start skipping over units, going through days, weeks, months, years, till it becomes like, you know, rewinding a tape in fast motion. Well, rewinding a tape, yes, speeding, 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 till it's going at super speed, till one comes back childhood, infancy, babyhood, your babyhood. Then one is able to recollect coming out from the womb, recollects coming the period of gestation in the womb, and one recollects right up to the very moment of conception. Then it said usually when one gets to that point, one comes up against something like a stone wall, something one can't penetrate beyond. But then it, the text says, at this point, one shouldn't become discouraged and give up. But this is like a woodsman who wants to cut a tree. When he's cutting, sometimes the axe gets dull. Then he doesn't give up, but he goes back to his called with the grindstone, sharpens the axe, then starts cutting away till the tree falls. And so when one comes up to this blank at the moment of conception, one goes deep into the fourth jhana till one makes the mind again very powerful, clear and sharp, comes out, then applies the mind with that determination to break through the barrier of conception. And when that happens, at a certain point, when the faculty is mature, the mind will pierce through that barrier of the rebirth moment and one is back to the death moment of one's previous life. Then one sends the consciousness back through the experiences of the previous life. Again, there'll be barriers and moments of unclarity. One uses the jhana as the grindstone until one could get through the second life, third life, fourth life. And for somebody whose faculties become very mature, as the text describes it here, one recollects one birth, two births, three births, four births, five births, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 100, 1,000, 100,000. Then the birth through many aeons of world contraction. That is the universe, the world system, goes through these alternating phases. World contraction, where it is compressed into a very tight ball probably space and time collapse upon themselves. Then when they reach the point of infinite compression, then there comes expansion, world expansion. Then contraction, expansion, contraction, expansion. And this is described in more detail. You just go refer to page 105, Sutta 4. And thus, I, I won't read it. <coughs> With their aspects and particulars. Oh, okay, we'll look at it. 105. Okay, he recollects there, I was so named of such a clan 
but such an appar- appearance, such was my nutriment, such my experience of pleasure and pain, such my life term, and passing away from there, I reappeared elsewhere. There I was so named of such a clan with such an appearance, such was my nutriment, such my experience of pleasure and pain, such my life term, and passing away from there, I reappeared here. Thus with their aspects and particulars, oh, coming back. Thus with their aspects and particulars, he recollects his manifold past life. And then there's a simile for this in Sutta 39. Page 369, paragraph 19. This is just as a man might go, everybody have it? Just as a man might go from his own village to another village and then back again to his own village, he might think, I went from my own village to that village and there I stood in such a way, sat in such a way, spoke in such a way, kept silent in such a way. And from that village I went to that other village and there I stood in such a way, sat in such a way, spoke in such a way, kept silent in such a way. And from that village I came back again to my own village. So it's just like I guess, I assume it's just as vivid, just as the impressions are just as clear as that of recalling one's travels from one village to another village and recalling all of one's activities in these different villages. And so, the Buddha says, this too is called a footprint of the Tathagata. Again, something footprint of the Tathagata, something scraped by the Tathagata. Yes, yeah, something scraped by the Tathagata, something marked by the Tathagata, but a noble disciple does not yet come to the conclusion that the Blessed One is fully enlightened. He's not yet reached the end of the process. Okay, so now, after mastering this knowledge of past lives, recollection of past births, now he's going to develop the second true knowledge. This is called the knowledge, sometimes it's called the knowledge of the divine eye, the Diva Chaku, or it's also called the knowledge of the passing away and reappearance or rebirth of being. According to the method of the Visuddhi Magga, the Visuddhi Magga explains that the meditator first masters the fourth jhana with a particular type of object to get this knowledge. The particular object for getting the fourth jhana should be one of three kasinas. The casinas are the colored discs, the disc-like objects. So he would take the three casinas recommended are the light casina, the fire casina, and the white casina. Of the three, it is said the best one is the light casina.
And so one masters <coughs> the fourth jhana based on, let us say, the light casino. Then one emerges from the jhana and using this very powerful mind, very clear, powerful mind, one sort of imaginatively suffuses light from one, the place where one is sitting. One suffuses light so that that light will illuminate other dimensions of existence. One starts extending light from one's own body, spreading light, so that this light will spread out, spread out, spread out, penetrate other dimensions of being that are ordinarily concealed from us. So that will reveal celestial realms, hell realms, the realms of other beings that exist in close proximity, in proximity to ourselves, but that we don't ordinarily don't see. And these beings will then become visible to one's, to the divine eye, to one's spiritual eye. And when one is extending the light, at times the light might become dull and dull and it loses its power of penetration, its power of illumination. In that case, what is the remedy? What does one do? Goes back into the jhana and again develops that light casino, then comes back out and spreads the light. And so now this light is pervading, 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 till when the mind is really accomplished in the jhana and one gets a lot of habituated to this practice, the light can illuminate many, many realms and dimensions of existence. And then what one does is direct the attention to beings in these realms of existence and fixing the attention on particular beings, one raises a kind of inquiry, what is the karma that brought this being into this realm of existence. And then through the power of the direct knowledge available through the divine eye, one gets a direct understanding what is of the particular karma type or particular type of karma that has caused that being to be reborn into that realm. And so one comes to understand how beings are reborn in different realms of existence by reason of their karma. This is, okay, we're describing it in Sutra 27. Okay, with the divine eye, which is purified and surpasses the human, he sees beings passing away and reappearing. It's being reborn, inferior and superior, fair and ugly, fortunate and unfortunate. He understands how beings pass on according to their actions thus. And that's described on page 106. It's a long passage. I'll just summarize it. Basically, those beings who behave wrongly in body, speech, and mind and held very bad types of wrong views 
they get reborn in the lower realms, the realms of misery. But those real beings who, who are well-behaved in body, speech, and mind, who had respect for the noble ones, who held right views, and so on, those have been reborn in the fortunate, in the good realms of existence. In this way, he understands how beings pass on according to their actions. Then on page 369, we have the simile for this. This is towards the bottom of the page. Just as though there were two houses with doors and a man with good sight standing there between them saw people entering the houses and coming out and passing to and fro so too with the divine eye which is purified and surpasses the human the bhikkhu sees beings passing away and reappearing and he understands how beings pass on according to their actions Okay, so this is like seeing people move back and forth between different houses. Okay, so this is the second true knowledge that the disciple attains. This also is called a footprint of the Tathagata, but again the noble disciple does not yet come to the conclusion the Blessed One is fully enlightened. And now we're going to come to the third knowledge. And it is with this knowledge that the work of eradicating the defilements actually takes place. And here I want to refer to my (laughs) table on defilements, antidotes, and types of abandonment. You have that table, this table. Now, the purpose for developing this third knowledge, this is the knowledge by which one is developing panya, wisdom. And the purpose for developing this wisdom is to uproot the defilements which are still lying dormant in the mind. That is, even though the disciple has gained, mastered the four jhanas, even though he's gained these two of these higher knowledges, still the jhanas, the first two knowledges, don't yet eradicate the defilement. They just eliminate the defilements at the surface level, the level of mental obsession. But the defilements are still remaining at the level of latent tendency, the anusaya level. And so what is necessary to deal with these with defilements at that level is Wisdom. First, the insight wisdom. This is vipassana prajna, vipassana panya, which will weaken the latent tendencies. And then, when insight wisdom reaches its culmination, it brings the penetration or breakthrough, pativeda or Abhisamaya, 
the breakthrough wisdom which eradicates them. And so that will bring about two types of abandonment. That is, the insight wisdom will bring what's called the specific factor abandonment. That is, when one is developing a particular type of insight, then a particular type of misunderstanding or wrong conception won't have the opportunity to arise. But it is when one is reaches the stage of eradication abandonment. But it is when one reaches the breakthrough wisdom that the defilements are eradicated by this by this eradication abandonment. That is, they're completely cut off at the root, so that they cannot arise anymore in the future. Okay, so this third bija, this third true knowledge, third higher knowledge, this begins with the development of insight wisdom. It's wisdom which is directed to the destruction of the defilement, but it has to begin at the stage of contemplating things as they really are. Okay, I spoke I used, before, I used the analogy when the mind coming through the four jhanas is being trained for the first two higher knowledges. I use the analogy of a telescope with more and more powerful capacities for seeing objects at far distances. Seeing previous lives, many, many aeons in the past, for seeing world systems, beings passing away, re-arising in other, in other realms of existence. But now we could use, for the development of insight, reverse the analogy and use the analogy of a microscope. Because now for the development of insight, this powerful mind is to be focused upon the examination and investigation of one's own experience, one's own existence. And so the mind in access concentration is already able to pick up and focus upon events occurring, just speaking in terms of analogy, Uh, say, the molecular level in access concentration. Okay, access concentration, the mind is like focusing on events at the molecular level. First jhana, it's capable of, this is speaking in that, uh, analogically, capable of focusing on events at the atomic level, secular atomic. Third, jhana, first jhana, (laughs) you threw me off. (laughs) Access concentration, molecular level, first jhana, Atomic level. Second jhana, we're down to subatomic level. Level of protons, electrons. (laughs) Protons, electrons, neutrinos. Masons. Third jhana down to the level of the quarks. Fourth jhana. 
there's bound to be discovered something more fundamental than the quarks. The fourth jhana gets down to events at that level, the level of rupa dhammas, to use the abhidhammic term. Okay, so I'm just, in a way, joking around. But the point is just that the mind in these jhanas can, as the mind goes through the jhanic experience, it becomes a more and more powerful instrument for focusing in on events at more and more subtle levels so that one can turn that mind on to turn it back upon one's own experience and start focusing upon the occurrence of bodily and mental phenomena at extremely subtle, extremely, extremely subtle levels, levels that are extremely brief in their occurrence. And so the meditator, after emerging from, say, the fourth jhana, will then bend that mind back upon the jhanic experience itself and observe the mind of the jhana as it was experiencing the jhana and start, instead of taking that experience as a lump sum, as a unitary whole, Start observing the jhana and dissecting it, analyzing it, observing how it is a compo- how it is a composite made up of components, how there is feeling, perception, volitional formation, consciousness within that jhana. And how that jhanic consciousness occurs in dependence upon the physical body. And how it also depends, taking as its object a particular form, the sign or nimitta, the object of the jhana. And then contemplating that jhanic experience, now analyzed, one sees it is made up of these five components, form, feeling, perception, volitional formation, and consciousness. And going in and out of the jhana and goes in to strengthen the mind and stabilize it then comes out in order to investigate analyze and explore the mind one starts seeing how these constituents of the jhana are constantly arising and passing away, arising and passing away. And then one extends that awareness of arising and passing away to one's own current experience and sees everything within one's own current experience as arising and passing away. The entire body is just a process of events arising and passing away. And what is taken to be the mind is just a stream of events Feelings, perceptions, volition, consciousness arising and passing away.
and this awareness of arising and passing away takes place at fe- it's because the mind is so powerful, so focused, so precise. The awareness is taking place at these very, very subtle levels so that it seems like the arising and passing away is occurring hundreds and thousands of times, even within the snap of a finger. So this is now the direct contemplation of impermanence. And one realizes that whatever is impermanent cannot be relied on for security. It's not a basis for any kind of lasting, stable happiness. In other words, it's unsatisfactory, dukkha. And whatever is arising and passing away Whatever is made up of constituents, what can be dissected, taken apart, is not a solid, stable self. It's not I, not my true self. And so one is now directly perceiving the entire field of experience in terms of the three characteristics of existence, impermanence, suffering or unsatisfactoriness, and non-self. And these insights now go to deeper and deeper to subtler and subtler levels until at a certain point the mind will turn away from this whole field of conditioned experience and reach, this is when a person's faculties reach maturity, The mind turns away from the entire field of conditioned experience and reaches momentarily the unconditioned, that which is not impermanent, that which is not suffering, but which is the ultimate bliss, the ultimate peace. And when that happens, then one makes the breakthrough to the true understanding of the Four Noble Truths. And that is called the knowledge of the destruction of the taint. Described here, he understands as it actually is. This is suffering. This is the origin of suffering. This is the cessation of suffering. This is the way leading to the cessation of suffering. These are the pains, this is the origin of the pains, the cessation of the pains. This is the way leading to the cessation of the pains. And here what are called the pains, going to have to take a little longer time than usual just to finish, just about 15 more minutes. But anyway, I could always say it's only 7 o'clock now. Yeah, the asavas, the yeah, taint, it's really hard to translate the word exactly. Taint, I don't really like it. I just went along, Venerable Nyanamoli had used it, so I just went along with him. Um, asava comes from the root means flow, flowing. Then ah, some can say it, some say it can mean in, some say it can mean out. So some translate it influxes, some translate it outflows, and it seems it might have either sense. The idea is that these are very, very deeply rooted defilements. Maybe you could say, I like to use the word 
the primordial level of the defilements. The defilements at the most basic level, the most basic defilements that keep one bound to samsara, to the round of existence. And they're conceived of, conceived of as in some sense existing deep within the mind and then flowing into conscious experience. In this sense, we could call them influxes, flowing in or influences, inflows. Or else we could think of them as outflows, flowing out from the mind through the senses into the world. The word was already in use before the Buddha appeared on the scene. So many of the ascetics, meditators, the yogis were already seeking a path to liberation from the asafas. So the Buddha picked up this term that was in current use and then gave it his own meaning. And as we'll see, the Buddha enumerates three principal type or three asafas, three taints. One is calm asafa. This is the taint of sensuality, of sensual desire, desire for sense pleasures. The other, the second is bhav asafa, the taint of craving for renewed existence. Here it's called the taint of being, which doesn't convey such a clear meaning. And then third, the taint of ignorance. The first two, these are different types of craving. And the third is of course, ignorance. And now this knowledge or understanding of the Four Noble Truths, though the text explains as though it takes place all at once, but it actually evolves through these four stages, these four stages of liberation, which I won't explain now. But here the teaching is presented concisely in a compressed form. So now the Buddha says, now I'm at page, top of page 277, this too, Brahman, is called a footprint of the Tathagata, something scraped by the Tathagata, something marked by the Tathagata, but a noble disciple still has not yet come to the conclusion the Blessed One is fully enlightened, the Dhamma is well proclaimed by the Blessed One, the Sangha is practicing the good way. Rather, he is in the process of coming to this conclusion. He is in the process of coming to this conclusion. Natvevatava Arya Savik Savako Nitangato Hoti Apichako Nitangachati. Yeah, you see, coming to a conclusion, it's a play on words that works the same way in Pali as in English. The point is that he's not yet really come to the conclusion of the path yet, so he's not yet justified in fully, you can't say that he has come to the conclusion that the Blessed One is fully enlightened. He's not yet fully confirmed that for himself yet. But he's in the process of coming to this conclusion. Because now he's gotten the essential knowledge of the Dhamma. He's seen the essential point. 
the Four Noble Truths. And he's in the process of eradicating the defilements, but they're not yet eradicated. That comes in the next paragraph. When he knows and sees thus, his mind is liberated from the taint of sensual desire, from the taint of being, but from the taint of craving for renewed existence, and from the taint of ignorance, now all the taints, all of the defilements have been uprooted. And when it is liberated, there comes the knowledge. This is the knowledge confirming that the mind is liberated. He understands birth is destroyed. In other words, no more rebirth. The holy life, the brahmacharya, has been lived. What had to be done has been done. There is no more coming, no more coming back to any state of being or to rebirth in any state of conditioned existence. Now the Buddha continues, this too, Brahman, is called a footprint of the Tathagata, something scraped by the Tathagata, something marked by the Tathagata, it is at this point that a noble disciple has come to the conclusion the Blessed One is fully enlightened, the Dhamma is well proclaimed by the Blessed One, the Sangha is practicing the good way, and it is at this point, Brahman, that the simile of the elephant's footprint has been completed in detail. And then when that is said, then this is a stock passage, 27. When this was said, the Brahman Janusoni said to the Blessed One, Magnificent Master Gotama, Magnificent Master Gotama, Master Gotama has made the Dhamma clear in many ways, and so on. I go to Master Gotama for refuge and to the Dhamma and to the Sangha of Bhikkhus. From today, let Master Gautam, Gautama remember me as a lay follower who has gone to him for refuge for life. That is the conclusion. I should just mention that there's a simile in paragraph in Sutta 39 for the knowledge of the destruction of the defilements that I should just refer to very briefly. This is page 370. Very nice simile, just as if there were a lake, but we're getting late. I'll let you read it. I don't have to read it out loud, but it's a nice simile, so don't skip it over. I just want to leave the few minutes that we have if there are any questions. If there are any questions, please. <laughs> yes, Suki. The stage of knowledge and vision, which is right for you. I'm not sure what you mean, the stage of knowledge and vision, which is right for you. No, avijja doesn't become vijja. Avijja is eliminated to some extent. One gains vijja and vijja eliminates avijja. You're right. There are different levels of right view. Yeah. Yeah. With the attainment of stream entry, then one gains the super mundane right view. Yeah. Panya, Panya has a very wide range. Even from intellectual knowledge as a kind of Panya. Knowledge gained from, say, deep study of the text, clarifying one's th- view or understanding through the text as a kind of Panya. Excuse me? It's both jnana and panya. Let's say it's jnana as information, it's jnana, knowledge, but it can bring a kind of panya, a kind of wisdom. 
but it's different from the experiential wisdom. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's an interesting question and it's a big topic. I can't deal with it now. Yeah, I just want questions relating to this discourse itself. Yeah. Yeah, the very last contemplation is that of the Four Noble Truths. Yeah, they both come to the same point at the end. Yeah. But they seem to be different process of getting there. Any yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, why does the text make that distinction? I think the reason is that it technically there's like a distinction between the stage when one is Okay, one is still contemplating and realizing the Four Noble Truths. But that realization, it takes time for that realization to actually sort of sink deep and bring the uprooting of the defilements. But once that knowledge is achieved and once the process takes place, the final goal, it's inevitable. It has to take place. But it's just a temporal distinction is the process still taking place or has it yet reached its end? So I think that's the point of that statement. That when the Buddha says he has not yet come to the conclusion but he is in the process of coming to this conclusion that is to show now he's reached the knowledge which is the the understanding but the understanding it's not yet actually brought the uprooting of the taints but the uprooting is taking place. Try to think of an analogy. One will come, but <laughs> it hasn't come yet. <laughs> Maybe it's like cooking rice in a rice cooker. <laughs> okay, it's like the time the rice cooker goes off, the click, but you still don't open, this is my experience, back <laughs> With rice cookers. As soon as you hear the rice cooker go off, you don't run over and open the rice cooker and start taking the rice out because it's still wet. You have to leave, let it stand for about 10 minutes till all of the rice, get, the water gets absorbed into the rice and set, it all settles down. Is that correct? <laughs> okay. But once the rice cooker goes off, then you know that if you just let it stand there, don't do anything, in 10 minutes, 5 minutes, 10 minutes, you open it up and you'll have rice to eat. <laughs> yeah. What is what in between? Divita. Nivita Nirod. No, that would ca- That particular pattern is not employed here. That would come before... I think one has to keep these patterns separate. But Nibida comes much earlier. This is really a very more, much more advanced stage. Yeah. Nibida is like the, comes before the direct understanding of even the Four Noble Truths. That's a stage of insight. But this is between 25, 26. This is the process of attaining our hardship. Okay, I think we'll have to stop. And next time we take... Yeah, next time I will go quickly through Sutta number 39. We've actually done a lot of it by considering the similes. So I just go quickly through it, taking some of the parts that we haven't looked at yet. And then Sutta 40. I might be able to do both in the same day. (laughs) Because a lot of 39 overlaps with Sutta 27. In fact, there might not be very much left in 39 to look at. (laughs) 
Anyway, we'll see. And then Sutta 40, which is pretty short. Then after that, I think it's number six. Sutta number six. Okay, we do the sharing of merit. Akasata Chabuma Ta Deva Naga Mahitika Punyantang Anumoditva Chirang Rakantu Sasanam Akasata Chabuma Ta Deva Naga Mahitika Punyantang Anumoditva Chirang Rakantu Desanam Akasata Chabuma Ta Deva Naga Mahitika Punyantang Anumoditva Chirang Rakantu Mang Parang Eta Vatacha Am Hei Sampadang Punya Sampadang Sabe Deva Anumodantu Saba Sampati Sedia Eta Vatacha Am Hei Sampadang Punya Sampadang Sabe Bhuta Anumodantu Saba Sampati Sedia Eta Vatacha Am Hei Sampadang Punya Sampadang Sabe Satanu Modantu Sabha Sampati Siddhiyam